Welcome everybody to this keynote session for the Research Data Alliance virtual plenary. Uh, my name's Cynthia Love. I'm one of the co-chairs of the um, Plenary 15 Organising Committee, which as we all know, was unfortunately cancelled due to this coronavirus pandemic. Um, I'd love to take this opportunity to applaud Research Data Alliance Organising Committee and the team at Research Data Alliance for actually switching so quickly into a virtual environment um, and enabling us to hear the wonderful words from our speakers and share in the, the meetings that have been happening. Before we start, we've got some housekeeping rules for you. The webinar is being recorded and we'll share the slides and the recording after the meeting. You have joined this webinar in listen only mode, which means that you're muted, but please feel free to type questions into the questions panel on the right um, during the talk or afterwards and we'll read them out and Kathy will answer them. So today's um, keynote is from Kathy Foley, who is the Chief Scientist of CSIRO. And CSIRO stands for Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. It is Australia's National Science Agency and Innovation Catalyst. It solves the greatest challenges through innovative science and technology. And it is one of the world's largest mission-driven multidisciplinary science and research organisations collaborating with industry, government, academia, and the community to unlock a better future for everyone. Dr. Foley has made significant contributions to the understanding of superconducting materials and to the development of devices using superconductors to detect magnetic fields and locate valuable deposits of minerals. She was awarded Agenda Setter of the Year in the Women's Agenda Leadership Awards in 2019, the Australian Institute of Physics Medal for Outstanding Service to Physics in 2016, and the Clooney's Ross Medal for the Australian Academy of Technological Science and Engineering in 2015. In 2014, she was awarded the International IEEE Award for continuing and significant contributions to applied superconductivity. And in 2013, she was named Woman of the Year by the New South Wales Government, richly deserved. Dr Foley has a passion for advancing scientific research and has held various roles, including a member of the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council here in Australia, President of the National Executive for the Australian Institute of Physics, President of Science, President of Science and Technology Australia, Editor-in-Chief of Superconductor Science and Technology Journal and Council Member for Questacon here in Australia. Dr Foley is a strong advocate for women in STEM and is committed to tackling gender equality. As a leader in CSIRO, she is working to enhance collaboration across the sector and turn more world-class research into benefits for the nation. And she's here to present on uh, thinking about data differently. If data is the new oil, will it mean that we will have regrets in, in decades to come? And we're very fortunate to have her speak. So join me in welcoming her, Kathy. Thanks so much, Cynthia, and hello, everyone. Uh, in Australia, we, we tend to begin uh, all our presentations with the acknowledgement of our traditional owners, and I want to do that now. And many of us are in Australia anyway are all over the place as we're in social isolation or um, social distancing. And, um, and I want to use this to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of our lands that we're meeting on all around the country and pay our respect to uh, elders past and present. And also my deep respect to those who are our Indigenous um, brothers and sisters who are, are listening in today. I um, do want to talk about this topic because it's something that's really important from my perspective, thinking about data differently. And we've heard about uh, data being the new oil. And, um, and the reason why this has come to mind is you will have seen that, um, that uh, I've just got to present figure out how I move these forward. Um, and uh, let's see, there we go. Uh, you just heard a long story, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Cynthia, about uh, CSIRO being Australia's National Science Agency. 
And uh, we have a lot of people. We uh, work to have about four and a half billion dollars a year of impact from our science. That's you know five times multiplier on our budget, roughly. And we're across many sites across Australia. And um, and it, as you heard, our um, our purpose is to solve the greatest challenges using innovative science and technology. And you know, like all of us, there are very many challenges. But we had to work out what to focus on. And for this, we started with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, of which I've just shown here. But there are very many, and sometimes they interact in each other with each other in a negative way. And so we've sort of done extra work where uh, we looked at from an Australian perspective of us, the Australian National Outlook, which last year we published um, a 2019 version. And in that, we were trying to understand what Australia would lo look like if we uh, did nothing and had a slow decline or undertook to take ac actions to uh, have their vision and outlook for a, a nation which we want and is the sort of aspiration of what we think is possible. And so with putting those together, we went through and um, identified what we think are the challenges we're working on, which are pretty universal. There's a sustainable energy and resources, which we all need, a secured Australia and region, and that's including not from a defence perspective, but also from cyber security and also biosecurity, future industries, and I'll explain why that's a different colour in a minute, resilient and valuable environments, uh, food quality and security, and health and wellbeing. But one of the things we've identified with all these challenges is if we are going to deliver on any of them, they do require the creation of new and future industries. And so for us to be able to do that, because if it was easy, we would have done it already. But we realised that for us to have that impact and to be able to solve these grand challenges, we actually do need to do things differently. And we've recognised that it's important for us to be able to have um, uh, the impact of a data and digital revolution, which is changing the way we do science. And that's a whole different presentation I could give another time. But we want to be able to do this where we are very trusted as scientists. And so um, we need to consider that the data science research projects that we undertake, that we consider three things. You know, first of all, does it achieve our purpose? Does it damage our trust and is it ethical? And a focus on ethics, social licence to operate and um, clear national benefit um, have always been determined by how we apply science and technology to these challenges. However, as many of you know, as we bring the digital into the domain, uh, it doesn't always work out the way we want. And this is something which I'm just reading the, the book, which has got a rather rude name, looking at the inside of Cambridge Analytics Plot to Break the World by Christopher um, Wiley. And that's a, a wonderful example of someone who went through um, thinking and get, getting carried away with data science and the power of it, but ended up having terrible regret about what the outcomes were. And as a consequence, um, it led, led me to think about how we want or how I want to get away from the idea of us having data regret uh, because of the work we're doing now. And I want to look at this from three aspects. The first one is ethics, then trust, and then purpose. So with ethics, um, it's looking at um, a new sphere that data science is a new field uh, or with the research ethics being brought in. And at the moment, we're lacking guidelines and principles in this area. And the thing is, it's not black and white. And for trust, we need to make sure we have the social licence to operate. And uh, because if we don't have that, uh, we can't achieve anything. And uh, to achieve that, we have to have trust. And, um, and also, it's, um, I guess, um, important to be responsible in the way we collect and use data. And then finally, it's purpose. Is this going to be something which we do, which is of national benefit? And does it help us achieve our purpose? So I want to look at some of these issues around ethics, trust and consent. And then um, what I'll do is give some uh, contemporary examples and with the current public crisis, uh, health crisis on COVID-19, I thought I'd finish off with that as a, a very relevant sample uh, example. 
So let's start with the uh, first bit of this talk, which is about ethics. So re-identification or de-identification of nature, uh, of data, which is very personal and sensitive insights that can be drawn about individuals, is something that is um, often uh, struggled with by, by researchers. And it's been found that scientists can uh, identify 99.98% of Americans from almost any available data set with a, as few as 15 attributes, such as gender or, or their um, zip code, area code, or their marital status. And this is already available in uh, much of the census data. And even so, mixing that in with something like Facebook. So CSRO's Data 61, which is part of a business or a business unit in, in CSRO that's looking at these things, has been instrumental in the development of de-identification decision, decision oh, it's hard to say this, decision-making frameworks. And they're doing it in partnership with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. And I'll talk about this a bit more later. But what they're doing is linking data sets that can make it possible for people or groups to be identified and potentially cause harm and, um, and try and work out how to prevent this. So a data set on its own may not pose a particular risk, but it's when it's linked with information uh, that uh, may allow it to be freely available that can create significant risks. For example, consent, um, especially in the new digital age. Uh, many consumers are unaware that they are consenting to something on various digital platforms that they use when data is being collected and how it's being used. I ask how many of us actually read all the fine print when we click on something on, on, online where there's uh, saying we agree to something. Do we actually know what we're agreeing to? In response to this, the Australian government has introduced a consumer um, data right to give consumers greater control over their data. The consumer data right is consent driven and it's one of its facets it, that is um, the ability to reverse or withdraw consent, which includes a um, right to delete. And I'll talk a bit about that a bit later. And then there's the um, lagging effect of the law trying to keep up with all this because risks are not fixed. They can vary and change over time. For example, data um, use that may seem safe now may pay, uh, pose a risk in the future and vice versa. So data needs to be interpreted in context, and this coupled with the pace of change in technology and social media platforms, we need to uh, make sure that uh, the law keeps up with it, and it's pretty hard to do that. So let's look at an example here um, of uh, how we can do that. Um, what people do uh, or do not understand is how their data is being used. Risks also relate to the potential use of the data in many ways that they never anticipated. And as a consequence, um, who originally collected the data and where it leads to may have actual harm to them. And this example of MyKey, which in Australia is the, um, the, the um, methodology used in, uh, in, in Melbourne for their public transport system for um, being able to pay for getting on and off um, public transport. In this case, de-identification may not um, always prevent re-identification. So the public transport, uh, Victoria, actually was found to breach the Privacy and Data Protection Act after a data set containing the records of roughly one and a half billion MyKey trips was exposed. The data release leak resulted in the possible re-identification of individuals' travel activity in the last three years. The data experts at CSRO's Data61 were consulted and they found personal information could be obtained from the uh, Public Transport Victoria data set without expert skills or resources. When two MyKey card scans are known by time and stop location, more than three to and um, more than three in five of those pairs of scans are unique and therefore more likely to be personally, uh, personally identifiable. So what uh, CSRO's Data61 did was look at re-identification from a new angle to try and prevent some of these unintended ethical consequences. The re-identification uh, risk ready RECNA is what they developed, or the R4, and it's based on groundbreaking research from Data61's Information Security and Privacy Group. It's pretty amazing what they do. So with re-identification, 
Uh, they model a um, re-identification algorithm as an algorithm that can link individuals in two different snapshots of data sets taken at different times. Then uh, they show that any non-trivial re-identification algorithm can only get a few of these links correct. They then aggregate the data set to different uh, granularities to check if the re-identification algorithm has an advantage close to a trivial algorithm or not. And based on this analysis, an organisation can determine at least a lower bound of the privacy risks associated with the purported release of a data set. This exercise also sheds light on the limitation of the syntactic uh, anonymity algorithms, such as k-anonymity. And uh, that's a, a method or a way of checking the identification um, that's a, that is useful for uh, while still practically um, making the data set still practically useful. Differentially, um, data, um, data, uh, private data access is also important. Differential privacy is a formal notion of privacy. An algorithm is said to be differentially private if the likelihood ratio of obtaining a certain result when given as an output of a data set without a user's data and a data set with a user's data is bounded by a small number. This implies that the, the user does not incur any privacy risk by taking part in the data set. Many differentially private algorithms have been proposed. Quite often, they also come with provable utility guarantees. This means that the result of any specific analysis will remain similar to the original data set. Our sub-projects are, are um, doing the development of a differentially private algorithm that shows online access to data while minimising the loss of privacy budget as a function of the number of queries asked and also development of a differentially private algorithm for data release that is computationally efficient as a function of the size of the data universe. Our partners include the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Department of Social Services and Transport for New South Wales. But there are many myths relating to data privacy. I just want to have a quick look at some of them. Myth number one is that um, uh, is about um, in, if information is de-identified, it's risk-free. So myth one is saying that if information is de-identified, then it's risk-free, and we need to challenge this idea that data can be made unidentifiable. And there's a lot that can, uh, that can give away who the person or group is. For example, recent studies have revealed the potential to use anonymous MRI imaging to, uh, of data to create an accurate image of a person's face, identifying them. Uh, the brain scans of 84 volunteers, for example, were used to create reconstructions of their faces, which is on the bottom row, and then tested against photographs. A facial recognition program correctly matched 70 subjects. Uh, and I want to credit uh, Mayo Clinic who did this work. The risks don't just arise from being re-identified, there are risks associated with what data may reveal about broader groups, communities, for example, such as stigmatisation. This relates to the common belief that data is somehow always benign, which is not the case. So myth number two, that, that information that is publicly available is fair game, for example, social media. And this is definitely not true. Data is not automatically benign. It is important about people's lives and their health, and it's information about that. P, um, data is about people. It's not just big numbers that come out of nowhere. A person posting on social media does not necessarily understand that the information might be used for other purposes like research, and, are, and they're not necessarily okay with that. Also, privacy settings um, can be confusing and public dissemination may not have been um, intentional at all. Ownership of and access to data does not mean that it is ethical to use in a certain way. And we need to use, um, consider risks and benefits that may arise. Data also now has a tangible commercial value and people are wanting to share the profit made from their information. And I suppose the uh, earlier um, indication of uh, the data, uh, the um, Cambridge Analytica is a really good example of that. So let's go to myth three, which is that um, encrypted data is secure. 
there are people buying encrypted data sets on the dark web, believe it or not, and they know that they will eventually be able to crack them. Hackers are harvesting data and then biding their time, waiting for technology to catch up with new methods of breaking encryption, knowing that this will happen fast given the rapid pace of change and development in this area. So uh, patience is something which is there for the, um, for the taking. And then in myth four, this is about saying that the more data, the better. Data for data's sake is not necessarily ethical. It's really important that we consider that data is um, that we collect is really needed for our purpose. If the intended purpose is broad uh, and we invest time seeking, speaking to colleagues about uh, what the risks are and might be and what the ethical implications are, then we're on the right track. But not all data sets are equal or reliable, even if they are very large. For example, we can be biased. If all your photos are of white men, your facial recognition system isn't going to work well on people with other genders or cultures. These are all important ethical considerations to ensure we don't look back with regret over the use of data. I want to now briefly touch on uh, artificial intelligence um, which is a really exciting area of data science, but also has incredible ethical implications. AI represents a powerful general purpose technology uh, that will help Australia and the world solve some of our greatest challenges relating to energy, health, aging, safety, security, climate, and the environment, just as, uh, which are all those grand challenges I mentioned before. However, any new technology does come with risks and adaptation challenges. And we need to ensure that Australian AI is ethical AI and delivers the benefits to all people. So in CSRO's Data61, we, uh, we were commissioned by the Australian Federal Government to develop an AI ethics framework, which we developed in partnership with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. The AI ethics framework examines key issues through a series of case studies and trends that have prompted ethical debate in Australia and worldwide. And these include uh, identifying de-identified data. For example, in 2016, a data set that included de-identified health information was uploaded to data.gov.au, which is a government website. It was expected that the data would be use, a useful tool, tool for medical research and policy development. Unfortunately, it was discovered that in combination with other publicly available information, researchers were able to personally identify individuals from the data source. Luckily, quick action was taken to remove the data set from data.gov.au, but still it shows the importance of issues of privacy and fairness. Another example is in Houston, USA, where teachers were fired by automation. In this case, an AI was used by the Houston School District to assess teacher performance and in some cases fired them. There was little transparency regarding the way the AI was operating and the use of this AI was challenged in court by the teachers union as the system was proprietary software and its inner workings were hidden. The case was settled and the district stopped using it. But again, issues of fairness, transparency, contestability and accountability keep rising to the fore. Another example is um, the Compass sent, um, sentencing tool. Compass is a tool used by the US to give recommendations to judges about whether prospective parolees will reoffend. There is extensive debate over the accuracy of the system and whether it is fair to African Americans. Investigations by a nonprofit outlet have indicated that incorrect predictions unfairly categorize black Americans as high risk or high risk. The system is proprietary software, again, it issues uh, and covers issues of discrimination, regulatory and, and legal compliance, privacy, fairness and transparency. Again, these issues coming to the fore. So the AI ethics framework recommends some core principles for AI, um, which I'm going to go through. So, um, sorry, that previous slide, I should have said, that's the list of them there. So they're the core principles. Generates net benefits, do no harm, regulatory and legal compliance, privacy protection, fairness, transparency and explainability, contestability and accountability. 
So that's really the basis when we do, go through and do our, um, uh, our thinking about managing AI. Okay, let's move to our next um, aspect of it, which is digital trust. Digital trust is a measure of consumer, partner, employee confidence in an organisation's ability to protect and secure data and the privacy of its individuals. As data breaches become bigger and more common, digital trust can be a valuable commodity for companies that earn it. What does the model for social licence to operate with data and digital look like? Let's look at the mining industry as a case study. Again, Data61 in CSRO and others are currently working on that question of what creates digital trust and social license to operate. Much of the work is based on an earlier 2014 study um, of the same ideas in the mining sector, where we were looking at the attitudes of Australians towards mining and what creates acceptance. Attitudes towards the sector may have shifted somewhat in recent years, but the study creates an excellent foundation when considering digital trust. This report summarises the uh, key findings from a survey of uh, a bit over 5,000 Australians about their attitudes towards the mining industry. The data collected in two blocks at the end of 2013 and, and the first quarter of 2014 um, uh, led to uh, forming a part of a larger program of work which we were doing in CSRO, examining the relationship between mining and society and different scales in Australia and internationally. And the data presented here was collected using an online survey. Oh, where am I? oh sorry, here we go, it's going the wrong way. The more negative respondents felt the impacts um, were, the less they accepted the industry. And of course, the more positive the respondents felt the benefits were, the more they accepted the industry. So the two strongest predictors of acceptance were the impacts on the environment and the employment benefits that flow from mining. Asking Australians to weigh up the benefits and impacts of mining was a strong positive predictor of acceptance over and above other individual impact and benefit measures. This relationship would also suggest that if this balance is perceived to move towards the negative impacts of mining over the benefits, that acceptance of mining will be eroded. On governance, the highest level of acceptance was found among those that felt mining had a low impact on the environment and had strong faith that our governments and legislation and regulation could ensure mining companies do the right thing. The opposite was also true, that is that the lowest levels of acceptance of mining were among those people who felt mining had a high impact on the environment and a low faith in Australia's governance capability. Um, Now, let's see, I've got myself in a model here. So let's now look at achieving a model license um, about building trust between companies, government and society. The way people are treated in decision-making processes and the way that benefits are distributed from mining and the role of governance in setting the rules for mining are important to developing this trust and acceptance. The study uh, looked at the role of the following in predicting trust and acceptance of the mining industry. So procedural fairness, such as the extent to which industry listens to and respects community opinions and changes its practices in response to the community concerns. The next is distributive fairness, the extent to which economic benefits from mining are distributed fairly and each citizen receives a fair share of the benefits from mining. And next is governance capacity, the extent to which Australians feel that our state and federal governments and legislation regulation can ensure mining companies do the right thing. The results suggested that trust in the industry is a strong predicator of acceptance of the industry. Or put another way, the industry's social licence is facilitated by the level of trust the Australian public have in it. Procedural fairness in the way that industry engages the public is a strong positive pred um, predictor of trust in the industry. The more Australians feel the benefits of mining are distributed fairly, the higher they, the level of trust in the industry. 
the more faith that people have in Australia's governance capacity to ensure mining companies do the right thing, the more they accept industry. And finally, the procedural and distributive fairness and governance capability are all strongly positively related to each other. One of the leads, one or, one or more leads to uh, the others. It took many years to develop this model and um, work to translate and build this into a digital domain um, will take many years as well. The research question is, what does the model for social license to operate with digital and data and digital look like? So we ran a digital trust survey with government, the Government Institute, which surveyed corporate executives. The survey doesn't answer this, it just starts the conversation with Corporate Australia. The term digital trust is actually highly ambiguous. It's interesting, an interesting observation that digital trust can also be an inhibitor to, in, in, to innovation. That is, innovation is important, but not as important as people's privacy and personal data. This must not be compromised until technology and the law catches up. Digital innovation is losing the trust of consumers and will be at risk of failing. The Australian government has introduced a consumer data right giving customers greater control over their data. Consumer data rights is uh, consent driven and one of its facets is the ability to reverse or withdraw consent, which includes a right to delete. In theory, you can go back on your decision to share if you later come to regret it. CSRO has been appointed by the Treasurer as the data science standards body assisting the independent standards chair to support the delivery of consumer data right. There is a large focus on research design, trust, uh, propensity to share data, and participant concerns related to data sharing. The uh, data standards body um, has found that comprehension regarding what is being shared and how that data may be used is not always great. That is, participants generally comprehend what is going on and do not always understand that data can be analysed and trans um, transformed to find out other things in addition to what the data uh, objectively contains. Data standards body researchers recently conducted an activity that tested if uh, participants understood what could be found out about them using a range of en um, energy data sets, for example. In general, they didn't have a good understanding of the possibilities, and in general, they were not comfortable with some of the possibilities proposed. This is um, especially true when it comes to de-identification of data. A number of participants have actually had a um, reasonable level of confidence in de-identification, but few have understood the risks of de-identification and the likelihood of being re-identified. Consumer data right uh, can't guarantee that bad actors and breaches won't occur, but they are designed to give people more clarity and control over the data um, that organisations collect. New Zealand's um, Data Futures Partnership have a useful activity that gauges perceived trust and benefit in a possible data sharing scenario with decreasing privacy scenarios over time. I've heard academics discuss findings from this and similar exercises using a boiling frog analogy, analogy to describe how people approach privacy over time. When presented with the boiling water scenario first, people are much less likely to share data and more concerned about the consequences. But when gradually boiled, they are more comfortable with their privacy being lost. This example is useful when we are considering possible regrets people might have about data sharing in the future. CSRO researchers are asking these questions in the digital domain. Are we doing research with, um, uh, we are doing research with RMIT over the impact of trust in the digital economy. And we're also doing research with Swinburne University over how to provide trust to digital economy through blockchain. And we are doing research into the balance between privacy and utility. And with this, we're saying, how do, we, uh, how do we account for and manage the risks posed by emerging technologies? What is the nature of trust in emerging technologies in the community? And how effective are our institutions at both seizing the opportunities presented by emerging technologies and managing their risks? So I just want to finish with purpose. This brings me to the third aspect of digital regret. 
key questions to ask are, does this help us at CSRO achieve our overall purpose of using science and technology to solve Australia's greatest challenges? Is it in the national interest and does it serve public good? If we can answer those questions with confidence, we can go far to ensuring we aren't looking back later with regret. Let's look at some quick examples because I can see my time is running out. And this is where we're going to be looking at something which is very relevant right now with our current health um, crisis. So how can we make sure that public data is being used properly in um, the public health crisis we're currently experiencing? Researchers at CSRO have developed a new tool to understand how human infectious diseases found overseas might spread to Australia. It's um, called uh, Dynamo or Disease Networks and Mobility. And this project combines CSRO's uh, domain expertise in health and biosecurity with the digital know-how of our Data61 business unit. Using um, data from dengue outbreaks in Queensland as a case study, the tool identifies and tracks new cases of infection to their original source in Australia and links how the disease was transferred between people. The tool draws on multiple incomplete data sets using reported dengue cases, tourist surveys, geotags, social media posts and airline um, travel and combines them in a smart way to understand the trends that underpin the spread of the diseases. Australia's um, e-research centre is using advanced health data analytics to provide federal and state governments currently with a dashboard of COVID-19 information to support decisions around the outbreak response. We are working to use Dynamo to forecast coming infections using spatial distribution of current cases and human mobility to forecast where the next cases will be. CSRO's Dynamo team will also collaborate with Data61's Transport Analytics Group to use public transport data to model COVID-19 spread through the network and identify strategies that will um, reduce and slow the spread. We will have more to say about that soon when it's announced more publicly. But while this data is being used for a greater purpose and for public good, it's not without its own ethical considerations. Last week, more than 100 human rights organisations, civil liberty uh, campaigners and consumer groups around the world have issued a joint statement on COVID-19 and digital surveillance. You can find it on, the web, uh, on many websites. The group are urging governments to use tracking technologies on mobile phones only if they're carried out strictly in line with human rights principles. The statement sets out three basic conditions. Surveillance measures adopted to address the pandemic must be lawful, necessary and proportionate. They must be provided for by law and backed by legitimate public health objectives. The second one is that any such powers must be time bound and only continue for as long as necessary to address the current pandemic. And number three is any increase in collection, retention and aggregation of personal data, including health data, must only be used for the purposes of responding to COVID-19 pandemic. The data must be limited in scope, time limited to the pandemic and must not be used for commercial or other purposes. So if data is the new oil, will it mean we will have our regrets in decades to come? Revisiting this question in light of what's being discussed today, I really believe it comes down to three things, the, the ethics, the trust and the purpose. If we can do due diligence to ensure that we, what we do is ethical and put in place measures to work towards mitigating unintended ethical consequences like de-identification is important. If we can work to earn digital trust through industry and government collaboration, the development of the social license to operate and the establishment of a consumer data right, then I think we're on the right track. And if we can ensure what we do is for the purpose of public good and is in the national benefit, again, it's the right way to go. We will go a long way to avoiding the digital regret if we follow these things. And it has the potential, um, if, and if we don't, we have the potential to be damaging individuals in the industry and possibly even our democracies. The CSRO was created 100 years ago, and it's around the, that time the world was dealing with the Spanish flu. To apply science to many of the challenges faced by fledging nation is why we were created. We continue to do this today using science and technology to solve Australia's modern challenges. And we hope that digital and um, data sets will be part of that 
but we will be using ethics, trust and purpose to make sure that we don't end up with something we regret in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. It's strange being online and not hearing applause, but yeah, I'll give you a... <laughs> um, put in your questions into the, um, into the box, uh, people who are listening in. I have got one, um, and just um, touching on that last point where you talked about, you know, CSIRO has been around for 100 years, and um, been doing research into a, a whole spate of things over that time. Some of the research involves going back and looking at data and information from decades previous. And I noted in the COVID-19 aspect of your talk, you were, you were talking about the very heavy restrictions that have been put on that data. How are we going to actually preserve some of that data so that it can be used in decades to come? That's a really good question. And that's one of those things where I think you need to make sure, first of all, you've got that, um, you, you go through, I guess, the three points. Um, the first one is, have we got ethics approval to uh, be able to have constraints around how you will preserve that data? With the, with the fact that we've um, identified the importance of it only being used for the purpose at hand and that it's not something that um, uh, that's time limited. And it may be that it's something um, that we have to get the social license to put together a, uh, a case properly with all the governance around it to say, where, how would it be preserved? How will it be protected? And under what circumstances would you reaccess that to be able to use it to do further study? That's again, that whole uh, thing of going back to having transparency, trust, governance, and, um, and security around it to be able to make sure that um, you're approaching it in the right way. Of course, at the moment, I don't know the answers to that, but it's something which I can assure you would be uh, carefully considered in order to progress um, what to do with that data at the end of this crisis. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fascinating, isn't it, too, with that, if we if we actually do have some sort of mediated access into the future, how does that get handed over? Or, you know, how does it stay? There, there have to be governance bodies around the fact that, you know, so, for example, your data, when when you leave the organisation, who takes over controlling that data yes. and things like that? There's a whole heap of governance and regulation there that Absolutely. needs to be. That whole thing of who owns the data and uh, even for our own data, um, what happens when you die? Who owns all the stuff on your Kindle or uh, in your email or on your yeah. Facebook page? These are things which, uh, if you go through looking at the AI ethics work that um, was done for, by CSRO, they start looking at that. But as a, um, you know, as a world, as a, a community, dealing with this, it's something where I think uh, technology is, is headed off and the rest of society is sort of catching up and blindly re you know, realising that there's so much convenience. I mean, uh, from met all of us around the world, at the moment, uh, the digital capability and uh, allowing us to work from home. I'm giving this um, this talk from a bedroom in my home, and it's you know amazing that we've been able to connect so clearly and so um, uh, pervasively. And yet, it's something where uh, all the stuff that comes behind it of how do we actually manage the things I all talked about are not necessarily home and hosed in a way where everyone feels that there's trust there, that there's fairness and all the things that I talked about. Yeah, indeed. Okay, we have another question here, which is how the three questions can be understood for cross-border data sharing? Uh, so that's the cross-border data sharing is a really big issue, especially since we've also got the issues of a lot of stuff is stored in the cloud and who sort of can access mm -hmm. that cloud when it goes across different country lines. And um, it's something where um, I think what you'll start seeing, and it may happen already and I don't know enough about this, is that, um, is that you'll be, I think we'll start seeing treaties uh, being set up, looking at management of data and how you actually agree to do that. We sort of have that in some ways already with some countries in sharing 
for example, um, security data between Five Eyes countries is an example where there's treaties in place. And I imagine over time that that sort of thing we will evolve and, e and develop as we come to terms with uh, the fact that uh, data isn't um, ethereal. It isn't something which is just, you know, matter of fact, it's actually something which has value that has um, has to be protected and has to be managed and um, and and there's a level of sovereignty attached to it so that you do need to manage it across borders in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, we have another one here, which is what guidance would you share with respect to guiding policy makers who are looking at data-driven portals on COVID-19 and don't adequately appreciate the data quality or lack thereof, latency and completeness issues. The US is experiencing serious problems because of this understanding gap between political leaders and scientists. Mm, that's a really tricky one. I, mean, I can only speak from the Australian perspective because of what is possible. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that you have a point of truth and so we're really lucky. Um, I work for an organisation where we're one of the most trusted organisations in Australia, and it is the absolute foundation of everything we do. We, um, uh, all of us who work in CSIRO, uh, have a sort of a public service thing where we're not allowed to have any any benefit from any of the work we do, uh, even stuff we do external to the organisation. And so that means that um, if you do any, if you say anything on behalf of CSRO, it has to be uh, something which you can trust and based on quality evidence and science. So what we're doing as an organisation is making sure that we're and, and is that we're providing that that information to government and making it as the point of truth in Australia. And I suppose that is really what is is needed is to identify. Um, the, uh, to have that trusted um, organisation which is um, able to not have any conflict of interest other than what is good and the right thing and not having any as much as humanly possible the biases that might lead you to present something in one way or another to try and put uh, a spin on it or a, 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 you know sort of whether something's positive or negative depending on political influence. And so yeah, that would be what I'd be recommending is the importance of having a research organisation that is fully trusted, that is, um, is in our case, a, a statutory authority that answers to government, means that um, I know that anyone in Australia sees data from CSIRO, they know that it's something that is, um, is to be believed and, and uh, they can um, heed that it's going to be as best information as po po currently possible. And, and for us, that's worked. And I guess when you were talking about uh, suggestions for policy developers, that's probably a way forward. Yeah. Okay, another one. With digital platforms operating internationally, how is CSIRO's research on digital ethics engaging with international conventions to manage inappropriate or unethical uses of data? Uh, so that's really important. In, for CSIRO, we actually have, um, an F, a, 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 and it's actually a responsible research code, which is um, across the Australian science sector, but it's something in, within our organisation is of very high importance um, and also uh, a, a necessary step to be able to uh, progress to be funded. We're a mission-oriented organisation, and so any research we do has to go through approvals and um, and part of that is the ethics approval of how you would go about um, dealing with data sets and how they are um, managed, mm. protected, used, shared, all that sort of stuff. And, um, and so that's our approach that we have in the organisation where there's a lots of checks and balances to make sure that, again, we're able to retain that trust and that we're able to make sure that uh, any data that is, um, or databases that are created are uh, handled in the way that are uh, as, as scrupulous as we possibly can. Yeah. 
So we have one here, and this one might be one that I may have a hand in answering too. Um, CSIRO has had its data repository trust certified under the Core Trust seal, which is an international um, convention. Are there plans to certify the trustworthiness of other CSIRO systems? I will pass that one to you, Cynthia, because that's your, <laughs> your expert on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, in terms of data, um, the, the data access portal is CSIRO's official and main um, publication of data area. We do um, certify our systems in terms of, um, you know, Australian um, uh, cybersecurity standards. Um, and those Australian standards are obviously part of an, a wider and international network. Um, the area that we're actually going to start focusing on is not just the this trustworthiness of the system, but also start looking at um, the trustworthiness of the data itself. And it's building on, on work that we um, have, have been participating in within the Research Data Alliance working groups. Let me see if I've got any more questions for you here, Cathy. I think that's it. Oh, great. Well, You're thanks. released back into the wild. <laughs> well, thank you. We're a bit over time. Thank Apologies. You. Yes. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you for a fascinating talk. And um, yes, on behalf of everybody in this webinar, we give you a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.